one of the things that I love about higher education is that we do not have to search too hard for meaningful work. And most of us got into higher education because we love our students. We see this as a time when they are doing these final pieces before they launch student development, um, growing as young adults, right? There, it's just this place where they're still malleable and we can still have influence and we can have mentorship and we can teach them. And also we really believe in the power of higher education to change people's lives. And so I, I'm thankful to be in this business where we don't have to make up some reason why it's meaningful. It actually is very, very meaningful. I think our problem is that we are so committed to good work that we forget to be kind and careful of ourselves. And that's really where we make um, a difference. Hello, everybody. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris for Resources, joined by Dr. Sherry Woosley. Uh, Senior of Analytics and Research at McMillan McMillan Learning. Hello, ma'am. Hello. So happy that you're with me. I feel like, you know, usually we have um, kind of every other week we spend time together, but I feel like it's been a really long time. It's been a really busy season. So I'm happy to get an hour (laughs) to spend with you today. Um, We were just saying that November's... uh, theme, I said a couple of weeks ago is stress and it has proven itself to be true, I think for everybody. Yeah. So <clears throat> we are going to spend some time on cap and gown today, dipping into some things that are happening in higher education. And so as always, I have our state of the union things, which I want to talk about, but then also I would just want to talk about kind of where we are, um, as faculty and staff and students at this point in everything, all the crazy things that have been happening. So you guys, please join us um, wherever you get podcasts. You can listen to us. Also, we have a lot of resources for you at taplink.cc slash Ferris resources. So you can go see some of our older things that we've done. A lot of great material. I was just talking to a school and they're like, your podcasts have been so helpful. Um, especially telling people, hey, go listen to this and then let's have a conversation about how we can make this happen on our campus. So I'm always happy to be useful. Um, <clears throat> all right, Sherry, our action items today, I mean, our State of the Union, no, our roadmap today, State of the Union, Froshmores, which you have introduced me to this idea. Um, there's a lot to be said about it. I want to talk about the Great Resignation and then As always, we will end with some action items because although I like ideas and big picture, I also know we need some specific things that we can do, right? Okay, so let's start with State of the Union. Um, There's a great article on Inside Higher Ed. It's been a couple of weeks ago. um, November 1st is when it came in. It was how cognitive bias hinders student success. And there's so many great pieces of information in here. I would really um, encourage you guys to go read it. It talks about all sorts of different cognitive biases. But two things in this article that I wanted to kind of call out as you and I are spending time together. One is that, you know, I'm always talking about how you show you're an expert with your students that students don't know all the things that they should be doing. And you do. And so when you say to a student, hey, you need to start studying before the night before, right? Or <clears throat> this is a place where you start to feel really overwhelmed. It's okay. It's That's how the semester goes. Then you get some credibility. What this article is talking about is students' cognitive biases, specifically the way that they tend to underestimate the time required to complete a task. And so when you give an assignment, or when a student's talking to you about an assignment, that you can give an estimate on how long that task should take, which I think most of the time students would be shocked, you know, because students are like, oh, it's an hour. And you're like, "Mm, I would expect this to take you about six hours. Oh, that's why you're going to stay up all night when you thought it was going to take an hour and actually take six, right? Also, students' um, tendency to procrastinate. 
So helping them by breaking those assignments down into measurable chunks. So I feel like we do this all the time in K-12, right? Like submit your first draft and then you're going to do this and then you're going to edit it and all of those pieces really like that. And then also because they have a tendency to cram, which is ineffective, helping them by replacing one or two or three high stake exams with more frequent uh, assignments, which I really love because it gives them so many more opportunities to be successful. Um, the last thing in this article that I thought was really interesting, because I preach this all the time, and Sherry, I know you agree with me about this, is that um, there is a desire for automatic nudges to help our students. And I think in some cases it does. But what this article says is they don't help us as much as we think that actually the way we make meaningful differences, um, this study of the effectiveness of text messaging uh, said basically they don't change people's behavior. A person-to-person engagement is what changes students' behavior, right? So there's some something, I think all of us do this. My my phone is so noisy. I'm like always getting nudges about all sorts of things. And I'm just like, why are you making so much noise? Versus when somebody calls me or it comes from a person, I'm more likely to spend time and energy on whatever it is they need me to do. So I love that. I think that makes sense. Also good news for our higher education partners, and that is uh, international enrollments are beginning to recover. So that is great news. Um, International students, new international students increased by 68% this fall over last fall. That's a lot of, there's political stuff going on, COVID stuff going on, but a lot of schools are really um, happy to see that international students are re-enrolling. Although, A lot of that is just on online. So we're still not bringing students back to campus, international students back to campus. They're just taking online classes. But so many um, institutions have that as their bread and butter. So that's good news for them. Okay, Sherry, did you go to the University of California, Santa Barbara? I did. That was my grad school. Your grad school. Have you, are you paying attention to this new res hall that they're building? Yes. Okay. Yeah, somebody, a friend pointed it out to me and I thought, no. And then I went and read it. And I do say, or one thing I think you do have to be aware of is Santa Barbara is like on a peninsula. They do have a land problem. Okay. That, like, that's that's thing to just know. Like, yeah. like it's, and it, it, you know, cause you, you think <clears throat> LA and like UCLA has a land problem, but Santa Barbara is on a peninsula. Like literally does not have any more land. Right. Yeah. So they can't really, I mean, you can't go into the ocean. You can't go like different (laughs) places. Um, But yeah, this one's interesting, isn't it? Because that same architect had done one at, was it Michigan? I think so. Yeah, Yeah. that's right. Okay. So for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, this 97-year-old billionaire Mm -hmm. um, turned amateur architect, which I don't think they're giving him enough credibility. Like he's made his money in real estate. He's done a good job. His name is Charles Munger. He donated $200 million towards a project um, for living quarters for University of California, Santa Santa Barbara. It's going to be $1.5 billion um, building. So it has, what, what's strange about it is it's going to house five thousand students, which is amazing. Um, But they are offering single rooms basically in place of windows. So there are some windows on the common areas, but almost every single room is built in a house. Actually, I think I have some pictures. So those of you who join us by by Zoom can see some pictures. It's like a house with, with a dining room in the middle. And then these tiny little rooms around the outside, eight of them. And they don't have windows in those rooms. Um, That's a picture of the room. But they do have fake windows with fake light that comes in that's tied to the sun. So it's like it's bright in the morning and and then it eventually gets dark, right? 
Um, and they have all of these amenities. It's like in the in this building, there's a market, bakery, fitness center, gastropub, game room, ga- grab and go room, and a kitchen if you want to cook. And he basically is like, I don't think students are ever going to leave this building. I don't know why you would. They're going to have a community. They're going to have everything that they need. They're going to vent in fresh air um, so that they don't feel claustrophobic. It's People are kind of going crazy about it. Actually, the lead architect from the University of California resigned over it because he said this is crazy town to put them in these small rooms. I'm going to be very interested to see how this goes. Well, I, there, there's some, like, when I think about it, there's some good things, the community space and, yes. and, and, and there are study rooms and other things, at least the Michigan building, there are study rooms up high. There are community spaces. Yes. So I, I think he's thinking there's community, but I'm hearing from res life people. This is not how they would set up a building to build community. And I do trust my res life colleagues and professionals understand how to do community in a residence hall. Um, The the other thing is, did you see the quotes from the students out of Michigan? No, this might've been okay, but when COVID hit, this was not okay. Oh, really? What they felt isolated or they felt, yeah, you got your little tiny room and you can't go anywhere. Like, so, so I think like the space of community is great if you're allowed out into the community, but I think Uh, at least according to the couple of the quotes I saw, it was, um, it was problematic in COVID and rightfully so. Yeah. Cause you really are isolated. I mean, I think the idea of such small rooms is that we're saying to people like, Hey, don't spend time there. Like that's not a place for you to hang out. We want you to come and be with us. Right. But then when you can't come and be with people, you go a little stir crazy, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. So it I'm is really- interesting though, isn't it? Because yeah. I, I, residence halls have moved a lot of them from the traditional corridor to the community space. And there's reasons for all of that. And people have been asking more and more for singles where we know for traditional age students, doubles are often better. So I, I don't know. I trust res life colleagues to, to, to give us more information. Yeah. Yeah. And to to teach us about this because they, they live it. They live it. Yeah. They (laughs) live it. It is really amazing to think about COVID impacting how we think about living space, how we think about community space and common space. So um, I will, I will wait to see the results on that one, but it's, it is, does seem to be very polarizing. People have a very strong opinion about it. Um, okay. Uh, student voice did a survey of 2000 students recently about mentorship. So I've been talking about this. I talked a couple of weeks ago about how important mentors are to our students, how it's one of the things that then predicts that they are going to live happy lives after college, that they have a primary mentor who's helping them. Um, 44% of those surveyed said they cannot identify someone who they could learn from or turn to for advice uh, on navigating college. So we have a gap there. And what I'm reading is that so often students just don't know how to get a mentor. They're like, I don't know how I would go about. It's not necessarily something that they've grown up with that idea. And so really making sure that you have a formalized mentoring uh, program is so important. There's a lot of um, information in the survey about, so 74% of students want career advice from a mentor. So that's really helpful to say we want to kind of organize this around a career aspiration so that students would would have that kind of insight. Um, It looks like female students, 40% of female students would rather have a female uh, rather than 14% of male students who don't have a preference. And then 56% of black students would prefer a mentor of the same race as opposed to 31% um, of all students of color and 5% of white students. So that's really interesting. There's some kind of, I see me and you, right, for um, some of those minorities. The other suggestion that this article makes is that you allow students some um, leeway when choosing a mentor. So it shouldn't just be a straight assignment that you should say, here are a couple of people for you to choose from who resonates with you. Um, so you give them some flexibility there. And then also, I really appreciate the idea that you should not assume that the mentors or the mentees have any idea what they're doing. Right. Because it's like I have expertise, but I don't know when I'm supposed to connect with you or what kinds of things I should be saying. And so 
guidance around here. We're going to teach you how to be a mentor. Here are the kinds of things you want to talk about. Here's the time frame. It doesn't mean lifelong. It might just be a semester, but really giving some good guidance, I think, is such a, a important piece of success for, for college students. Sherry, did you have a mentor in your undergraduate no. in any of them? No, ah. I did. I, I did actually work on a program that I thought was cool. I worked on the data side of the program um, when I was at Ball State working there. They had a mentor program for students with disabilities. Oh, and it was fabulous because it made connections for those folks, maybe outside of their strategic, like their regular thing. It helped them like have a safe space to talk about how to advocate, how to get the resources, how to, what Great. careers. And it, it actually very much made a difference for students with disabilities. Yeah. So, that's awesome. I mean, that's um, the same sort of idea, right? Like I need to yeah. see, I want you to have walked this road and I need to see myself in you in some way. Yeah. Or I need to have a place to have those conversations that's maybe a little safer than my standard professor or Ah. um, the other thing that I have to say that I hadn't really thought about. And I know this leads to our next topic later is um, I recently talked to a company who was doing mentorships for employees and things, but what they were doing is reverse mentoring where the new employee gives perspective to the leadership or to other people. And that might be an interesting thing to think about even on higher ed. I mean, this new generation, this new set of students has experiences and perspective that's very different. For sure. That would be a fun kind of way to think about mentoring. Yeah, I love that. I I just took a whole trip about first generation students, right? And so thinking about having those meetings with them where they're like, hey, these are the places where I have no idea what you're talking about. These are the places where can we change the language because it doesn't make sense to me or the process feels overwhelming or whatever. I love that. That's good perspective. Yeah. Um, okay. You and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. So the coalition for college, which is, was born out of a technology problem with the common application, the coalition for college basically came about in 2013 and they created an app so that you could submit your common application and it would go out to whoever's using that. Right. So I think it's like 900 schools uses that use this app. Well, on the last day to submit the app, the application, the technology broke for 24 hours. So these poor students were like, here's a couple of tweets. School, you're going to end up missing out on a lot of amazing students since the coalition application has been down for hours. We cannot apply literally. Or coalition application is down. I literally cannot handle the stress. Literally, I have a concussion and I'm supposed to reduce stress in my life. So wait, when was it down exactly? Was it Sunday? It was down, yeah, it was down November 15th from 11.59 to November 16th, 11.59. So that, so they've extended the, the due date for a day, which was kind but you just know all over living rooms in the United States, people were pulling their hair out and going crazy. Well, I'm laughing. We were wondering why it was so slow. <laughs> <laughs> At least you got your stuff in. What they said Research, was right? is yeah. that every question created an error. So anytime you put something in, it would be like error. And then you'd go you back. must have and gotten it in ahead of time because we didn't hit that. Yeah. So, yeah. so I feel so, I feel, I feel bad for everybody. That's just a nightmare. Okay. And then the last thing is, did you know this Jeopardy is going to host a tournament of professors? Isn't that oh, fun? That so December 6th through 17th, they're going to have the tournament. The debut game is going to have an English uh, professor from Pennsylvania State University, a law professor from Vanderbilt, and a chemistry professor from Roanoke College. Love it. And so we're going to have uh, faculty facing off against each other, which I think is so fun. Yeah. And that is the State of the Union. I've been working on my tagline. I got it. I got it this time. I got it down. Um, okay, Sherry. So you introduced this term to me, Froshmores. And I have a couple of slides that I want to use to introduce this idea. 
Um, side note, MIT has a blog that's run through their admissions, which is written by all students. And I love it okay. because they're going through and they just have students who are talking about their experiences and saying like, it's super hard to go to MIT. Your first semester is really difficult. And here's what I experienced. Or we're at that point in the semester where, you know, midterms are coming and everybody's stressed out. It's just a lot of language coming out of students that is helping normalize and kind of cast the vision for where we are on the semester. So I love it. So this comes out of their blog. They have a student who wrote, um, she did comics on the being a freshman. So it's not quite a real sophomore because you don't know where anything is. Yeah. So you're like on campus for the first time, but you don't know where your buildings are. You don't know what's going on. You feel really overwhelmed. The other thing she says about it is that it's finally getting to experience normal MIT for the first time. Um, but also the hardships of like, oh, right, I'm late to this class because I don't just have to open my browser to join, right? So oh, yeah. I haven't been late to a class before because it was so easy to get to. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, also, I love this. She says, freshman fall, it's like a, a higher fire hose. So you have all these calibration issues, right? So freshman fall, you're calibrating to the rigor of classes, Mm -hmm. Freshman spring, you're calibrating to balancing in-person social life because you haven't experienced that. And then sophomore fall, you have all of these more in-person things like cooking and harder classes, and you're constantly trying to calibrate. And she actually says, we have had three different orientations because we've had gradually different experiences from totally shut down to some in person and then, you know, being on campus. And so it's just, as we think about transition difficulty, you are putting this class through transition difficulty after transition difficulty after transition difficulty. And, um, it's a really, I think, high at risk cohort, right? So tell me what, how you've been thinking about this uh, group of students. Well, I, I, I came across the Froshmore comment um, or, or language um, listening to somebody from Rutgers because they are doing some, and they've done some really cool things and, and the way, and I, I hesitate to, I forget her name. She was fabulous, was talking about how, yeah, they're back and we think of them as sophomores, but they have this kind of piece of knowledge that an experience that was missing. Yeah. And so she was even talking about, you know, you have an intern and they're a sophomore and you assume a bunch of things that aren't true and, but they're not freshmen because right. they've been in classes, they've done other things. So I, I like this notion of Froshmore. It, it makes clear kind of this weird in between that they're experiencing. Yeah. Um, and I like I some of the different things that, that um, Rutgers was doing was interesting. Um, one of the other comments, the woman was on a podcast about Froshmores. And one of the other comments that came up that I thought was interesting was they said that prior to the pandemic, to create sense of belonging, many, many campuses relied on a sense of place. Yeah, I love that. And that was kind of, I mean, blown out of the water with the pandemic. You couldn't create this sense of place and belonging for students. And what was interesting to me is they were talking about it as if our reliance on place was a bad thing. I think it was when the pandemic hit because we yeah. didn't know how to pivot quick enough. But I don't know that it is a bad thing overall because I yeah. think sense of place should be part of belonging. I totally agree with you. It's really funny because I think it is, if it is the only thing you're doing, it's lazy. If that's the only thing that you're talking about, right? That's lazy. That's not actually a sense of belonging. But when we talk about building community, one of the pieces of community is stage, right? It's like, where are we when we are being together, using the same language, where we have our rituals and we have our rules and all of that kind of stuff. And so I, I totally agree with you that the piece of 
all we're selling is place. So as long as you're in this place, then you just know that you belong here. And what the pandemic did was say, no, that's not actually, you better figure out how to be building community, even if your place is Zoom, right? Um, It's actually why I think so many smaller schools that have a very strong mission or value statement did so well with retention and persistence because they were not relying on the surrogate of place. They actually were helping students understand this is what it means to be part of us, which is what they were really craving, right? That's actually what they needed. So I love that. I also saw a really interesting talk by um, a Native American indigenous person researcher who talked about how tightly linked sense of place is for Mm. indigenous identity. And I had not, I I don't come from that background. I didn't, but, but as he was talking about how the land made such a difference to everything about how that culture and those identities developed, you know, it got me thinking about, you know, how place and land and those things played into different parts of my identity, different Mm -hmm. parts of my belongingness. And if you notice anybody who talks about a campus oh, have you ever been to the campus? Do you remember this? It is almost always a sense of place or a tradition. Yeah. So, Sherry, yeah. it's so interesting because, you know, I'm raising a Texan, but I'm I'm a New Yorker. And yeah. so my daughter, who's nine, I took her to New York City this last summer. And she, in the middle of that trip, was like, I understand you so much better now. <laughs> And it was all about place. It was all about, do you see this 27 story building? This is where I grew up. This is the park that I would go play in. This is the school. These are the streets that I learned to walk. So I walk fast and I weave in and out. And there are so many people and you can't say hello to them. Like it was all about her being in that place and and understanding now something about me, right? So you just think about that. It's why we do campus visits because we want you to come into our space and and experience what it means to be here. Um, But it is definitely just one element of all of those different levels of community. I thought Rutgers was so smart because I don't know if you read this in the article where they were like, for freshmen, we did a campus tour for Froshmores, we did a scavenger hunt because clearly they're not freshmen, so they don't need the tour, but they really do because they don't know where anything is. Like they've never right. been here, right? right? But even just changing those la- that language of like, this is a second year social and this is a second year welcome, as opposed to um, what happens oftentimes like with transfer students, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about is like transfer students know how to do the academic piece we have to then introduce them into the community in a different way without lumping them in with our freshmen. So I wonder if we'll learn and be able to take that to transfer students because we should. I mean, how absolutely. Cool is that? Rather than First, kind of giving them a little tiny orientation that is minimal, can we really build and get them into the community in yeah. different ways? And I would say for anybody who's listening, I think you need to be, so you, you didn't do it in the fall maybe, but there are still opportunities this semester and next semester to identify that Froshmore group and to do special programming around the kinds of things that they need. So I, I love it. I think it's great. Um, okay. So I want to talk about, um, most of our time today, we are going to be um, talking about this article called The Great Resignation, How Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Could Be the Key to Stopping Employees from Quitting. Um, And this is not higher education specific, although I think it could be. I think there's so much in this article that's going to be really helpful to our listeners. I want to just talk for a minute about burnout. Um, So I want to remind us what this is. You guys remember burnout comes with a decreased sense of accomplishment. So nothing I do makes any difference. We're just in that the wheel, right? And we're just, we just keep running and I can't make any difference. Emotional exhaustion, which is the fatigue that come, that comes from carrying too much for too long. 
Um, and then also this depersonalization, which is I don't have any more empathy or caring or compassion to offer. I just, it's gone and I cannot muster any up. And Sherry, I was looking at the, um, first of all, I looked up the definition of, of burnout. The first one is about like literal burnout, like technical, like machinery, but it says the reduction of a fuel or substance to nothing through use, through use or combustion. And I was like, right. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a pretty good definition. Like there's nothing left because we've used it all up. Right. Running on fumes. Yeah. Right. (laughs) We're running on fumes. So causes of, of burnout, lack of control. I just, I'm thinking of the last 22 months, right? Lack of control, Mm -hmm. unclear job expectations, Mm -hmm. extremes of activity, Mm -hmm. lack of social support, and then (laughs) work life imbalance. It is like the perfect recipe for burnout. Um, and then they say uh, the following factors might contribute to job burnout. If you have a heavy workload and work long hours, mm-hmm. which Matt just did a spark report with a school where um, one of the employees logged a thousand hours of COVID care over the last two semesters. As if a they didn't thousand- have any other job. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's not like they had a job before COVID came. It was just, you know, so oh. long yeah. hours work, struggling with work-life balance. If you work in a helping profession, Mm -hmm. or if you feel like you have little or no control over your work, these are all risk factors, which all of our people have those things, right? It's just inevitable in the the environment that we're in. Um, And so I, I don't know if you have seen this. Every time I talk to one of our clients, I just see in their face complete exhaustion and a question of sustainability. So we can't keep doing this, right? That's, and also do not, Rachel, do not tell me one more thing I should be doing. I don't want to, I don't want to hear, could we invite these people? Could we do this thing? Are you doing this? Do not say one more thing that you want me to be doing because I am hanging on by a thread, exhausted. Um, and you were just telling me like, you have expertise in burnout. This is what your dissertation was on, which I had no idea. It's so fortuitous. 20 some 20 some years ago, um, we were, I mean, back then we were very concerned about turnover of K-12 teachers. And, and I look at now we're concerned about turnover about everybody. There's the great resignation. I, I don't know, two, three, four articles a a week, at least about employee turnover problems with hiring, everybody leaving. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. And so, go ahead. Yeah, no. Uh-uh, uh. <laughs> Can we just sit in that for a minute? Cause I feel like everybody is like, so I've said this before that it's like in the beginning, it was kind of, we're all on the same team and we're going to get through this and it's going to take six months. And, and I remember Sherry very early listening to NPR and somebody saying, people are saying it's going to be two to three years before we can recover for this. And this is like six months in. And I was like, that's impossible that there's no way that we can do this for two to three years, but here we are. I mean, we're coming up on two years, right? So I think people are just exhausted. I was um, doing some research about the five stages of burnout. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting because I identify with this so much. So first of all, we have the um, subtle dissatisfaction. The first stage of burnout is characterized by a lack of awareness that anything is wrong. You might have minor thoughts of discomfort or a subtle gut feeling that something is off, but most of us just write that off as this is life. Like it's fine. Right. And this is the early early pandemic. We're like, yeah, you just keep going. It's going to be okay. It's hard, but it's fine. We just got to get through this. We just have to get through this. Right. Then we have number two, which is subconscious disregard. Mm -hmm. Um, This stage introduces thoughts and emotions that are increasingly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. 
Repetitive mental patterns start nagging you and signaling that something is off balance. At this stage, your subconscious is fending off the symptoms. So it's not like you're, you're manifesting those physically. It's like, I'm doing really hard work to be able to just keep doing what I'm doing. Um, Although we do feel a little bit tired in this stage, right? Because we're, our brain is working so hard to try to keep things settled. Then we have number three, conscious numbing which is where feelings start to overwhelm us. We feel exhausted. We have a lot of anxiety and it's too much for our brain to be able to keep in the background. And so we start relying on one or more numbing techniques to defer discomfort. So that can be substances, but that can be food or that can be, I'm just going to play my video game all day or whatever the thing is where you are like, Hey, I have to pretend like this is not happening because it's just too big. I'm going to watch. I'm going to, all those right. things we did. I mean, all those things we did. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And then we get to where I think most of us are right now, which is anxious exhaustion, which is where we are. It, it's kind of the flip side of the numbing. It's like you numb. And then when you come up to the surface, there's so much that you just are like, it makes me anxious and I feel totally exhausted. So um, extreme emotions, sensations in your body, even when you're supposed to be resting, you cannot because you are constantly thinking about all of the things that you should be doing, all of the things that you need to be taking care of. Right. Um, and then the last one is just trauma. This is just uncontrollable anxiety. You can't, you don't know how to get out of it. You feel completely overwhelmed and you can't manage it. And so I, talk about that to say that is normal. We need to really have real conversations about it. But Sherry, also, I think in higher education, we we were in some stage of burnout even before COVID started. And so it's been, I mean, I think you see this in hospitality. You see this in um, met the medical profession, there are these places where people were already feeling really overwhelmed with everything that they had to do. And then COVID came and just like piled on and piled on and piled on. But I'm really concerned about our higher education professionals. I think that this idea of the great resignation, I don't think it's inevitable, but I think if we are not careful with ourselves, that's the place that we're really headed. Um, interesting from what you've shown, um, the, what was it? Anxious exhaustion, anxious exhaustion. I think there's a lot of folks sitting there because the conversations I'm hearing when I say, Hey, let's, you know, cause everybody's like, Oh, we're going to maybe get back to normal, but it's like, we can't slow down. Right. Or, or the people that I see who are trying to, they're like, I just feel like I'm not doing enough. Okay. Let's talk about what's enough. Not yeah. enough in the midst of the pandemic crazy, but what was enough before? Like That's exactly right. I, don't know, I had a uh, conversation with an employee the other day and I was like, you do realize that normal is 40 hours a week. Like, right. that's where we're supposed to be. Right. And it doesn't mean 40 hours of sprinting. <laughs> it means <laughs> right. 40 hours of like working. But I, I think we've almost even forgotten what normal could or should be. What I, Yes, I totally agree with you. I think there is something about the holding of stress and anxiety that then becomes normal yeah. and you're afraid to unclench and, and relax because you have been in such a heightened state of just do what it takes, just do what it takes, just do what it takes. And the truth is, um, I don't know if this ever happens to you, but there are times where my brain gets crazy with like, uh, distractions, so like the TV's on and I'm playing candy crush and I'm taught like, you know, and then the settling of my brain is very uncomfortable, right? When you turn that off and yeah. you stop doing that and you just sit quietly, like Rachel, just get a book and read a book. And it's really difficult yes. because you're so used to this stimulation and busy brain that the, Hey, can we just settle and be calm? Very uncomfortable so uncomfortable that oftentimes we're like, forget it. I'm not going to read a book. I'm just going to go back to doing all my crazy stuff. And I think what you're saying is right, Sherry, that there are people where we have just gotten used to crazy brain, unhealthy, exhausted anxiety, and we've forgotten how to 
settle and just be for a minute, right? And I think even if we look at our output, we think I'm not getting enough done. Okay, actually you are, you're just used to running in sprints so fast. Yeah. I, I remember being a very early professional and one of my um, really good managers said to me, if you get in the habit of working 60 to 70 hours a week, you're going to expect that level of output always. And yeah. if you ever go back to 40, you're going to think you're slacking when in fact you're not. Right. You're healthy. You're being healthy. Yeah. Like, but, but it's an interesting perspective of if you're used to doing that much and getting that much done, even if you get normal, it's going to feel like you're not, I don't know, contributing enough. Yeah. And I think that is especially true for jobs that are meaningful. Um, If you think about like, I, I do meaningful work. So our schools depend on me because their students depend on them. So I need to do really meaningful work and I'm a mom and that's a really important job. And I want to be a good friend, right? Here are all of the things that are really, really important. I can, I can get confused in my brain that I should be working 70 hours a week at that. And I think what's happening with people is just now they're starting to question the sustainability. I mean, which congratulations, you've done that for a very long time, longer than anyone should have ever expected you to. We should be questioning sustainability. You know, when I see schools that are doing a thousand hours of student care and their retention has increased, which is wonderful. Yeah. But are, is that what we're doing now? Like we're going to add that extra work all the time in order to get those outcomes. That's not sustainable. Right. Have you, have you read, there's a new, I don't know if it's new. I only just saw him recently talk and I've got the book on my iPad right now. Um, it's like 10,000 weeks or something. It's about how many weeks you have in your life. But one of the things he said that I just love is he said, um, part of our obsession with time management stuff, you know, this time management way, this time, part of it is we're trying to fit an infinite life into a finite life. And he said, that's never going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> like, and, and, and isn't that what we're, tra- we're trying to fit an infinitely, an infinite job that is critically important into a finite space. There's no way to do that. So Sherry, I, I love that because I think the reflection is there's some warning in that. Forget about COVID. If all you have is a finite amount of time, you have to mourn the fact that you're not going to have time to do all of the things that are good or important or meaningful or whatever. That's just true. And we have to be sad about that. But even more than when it becomes so apparent in COVID, we're working really hard to do those good and meaningful things. And yet that's a, a fool's errand, right? That, that's never and If you hold happen. yourself to that standard, you're beating yourself up. Because yeah. for nothing, because nobody can put an infinite amount of work into a finite work week. Nobody. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's talk about Ma- Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And what I really appreciate about this, so this article talks about reasons why people quit jobs. So the top three reasons why people are quitting their jobs are 54% didn't feel valued by their organization. didn't feel valued by their managers and 51% didn't feel a sense of belonging at their work, which is remarkable because there's a narrative, um, especially around the great resignation, that it's about money and it's about time. And I think those are things to be considered. But what this research is saying is that people want to feel valued and like what they're doing is good and important work. And if you can provide that for them, they want to stick with you. Right. Um, I want to feel seen and heard, right? Like, yeah. 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 Um, Also nine out of 10 career professionals would sacrifice nearly a quarter of future earnings for consistently meaningful work because we want to contribute We want to bring value to other people, to the world, to the people that we're serving. And if we're just digging a ditch and filling it in and digging the ditch and filling it in, 
that's not what we were created for, right? We want to provide value. And so um, this idea of, I, I think it's really remarkable, the the intersection of our students stay when they have a sense of belonging, when they feel like they're a part of our community. Guess what? That's why our people stay too, because they feel valued, they feel seen and heard, and they have a sense of belonging um, on our institutions. So it's amazing how much this fits with the burnout. The, even the theory of burnout, you start to not feel like what you're doing matters. Right. And then we have a great resignation. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's what happens actually. Well, so, and, and if you think about students, I don't know that this academics matter. I don't feel seen and heard. Of course, they're going to rethink. Yeah, yeah. We send them online where they don't feel seen and heard. Mm-hmm. It makes sense that they would lack academic goals, academic vision, yeah. feeling like they belong in this place. Yeah. So what I love about this article is um, it says, first of all, when the outside world is really uncertain, you need more purpose in your day to day, which I've been talking about this a lot. The idea that I have to be present when I'm making my daughter's lunch, right? Because that is a place where I can create meaning when everything else is crazy town. Um, focusing on the things that you can control and being really present in why am I doing this thing? How do I connect this to meaning and purpose so that I feel like it's valuable instead of, um, I think, you know, as I'm talking about crazy brain, one of the things that happens with a busy, anxious, exhausted brain is that you can't be present in those small things because you're so frantic you can't slow down and say, Hey, this thing that I'm doing for the student, this is really important. I need to be really present here because it's meaningful work. Right. Um, so this article also ties Maslow's hierarchy of needs to careers. So what they say is basically it used to be that jobs fulfilled, um, these bottom two rungs. So let me just remind us the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is about, uh, physiological needs. So this is food, water, breathing, shelter, shelter, clothing. And then we move up to security and safety. So we want financial security. We want health and wellness. We don't want to be in danger. We don't want accidents or injury. Um, Things like health insurance and contributing money to a savings account or living in a safe neighborhood. Those are those two bottom rungs. And this article says it used to be that we would say to our employers, as long as you're providing those two things, that's good enough for us, right? Um, In fact, a lot of the gig economy is based on this idea that as long as I have a job where I'm safe and I can make money and I'm I'm healthy, then I don't need all a job to support all of this other stuff that's up there, right? I can just go, go and do this on my own. Um, the next needs are about social needs, love and belonging. So this mm-hmm. is We are built for friendships and social groups and community and organizations. And in order to avoid loneliness, depression, and anxiety, we want to feel loved and accepted by other people. So absolutely, we would find sense of belonging there. And then the next one up is about esteem. And this is appreciation and respect. I want for somebody to appreciate and respect how hard I work. the the contributions I make, right? Exactly what you're saying, seen and heard. And then we move up into that self-actualization. But the theory of this article is that people are no longer okay with a job just giving them health and money. They want to belong somewhere, which I think is so powerful. Um, And the idea that what employers can do is help create a culture of community and belonging. And then you can't pay me enough money to go work somewhere else. Right. Because then it's a huge risk to leave because yeah. that next place, they may t- pay me 10% more, but they don't have the things I need. And it's yeah. sure hard to decide if they have the things I need, if I'm sitting in a good place, it becomes riskier. Right. You know, Sherry, that's so funny that you say that because we, um, Ferris does a really good job of sense of community and belonging. We all love each other. We love spending time together. We go on vacations together. We like each other. And we have had in the past interns who have never had a job before. 
mm-hmm. who would come and intern with us. And then we would maybe offer them a position and they'd be like, no, I'm going to go to another job. And then after a year or so, they would be like, mm-hmm. I had no idea. I had no idea how remarkable it is to work in a place where there's mutual respect, where we don't have drama, where we like each other, where we do good work together. And so that's right. You don't even know what you're looking for if you take, you know, if you're in a place where you get all those things and you're like, yeah, every place is like this. Uh, no. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, we've been doing some work on, on employee retention lately. Yeah. And it's been so fun because um, for me, it's back to my roots of stuff, but also I think because it infuses so much of what I do and so much of what I've been reading are how important the managers are. And at one level, I get it because a manager can create sense of love and belonging. They can create, you know, uh, opportunities for self-actualization that manager can do those things, but I, I, I'm so frustrated with the articles that say the manager is everything Yeah, because it may not be the manager that gives you the sense of belonging. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. So as we focus on this notion of we got to have good managers, we've actually missed the point of like that Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. Um, the other one that I see all the time is everybody's worried about balance, right? Right now, which I get it totally fair because so many of us are working too much, but the solutions are you know, we'll reduce the number of meetings. (laughs) Well, like, and those things are important, but the reality is, is my job meaningful, interesting, growing? Do I feel seen and heard? And am I seeing a future for myself? Right, right. And if you can get those three things, it doesn't matter if they come through the manager, it doesn't matter if they come here, but Yeah. Yeah. That future. Do I see a future? I mean, I think that's another difficulty is that we are not thinking about the future. We are only thinking about what do I have to do today, tomorrow, next week, right? We're not thinking long-term because we are the future. Imagine this, right? This continued forever. No way. I'm out of here. Yeah. That would be so, that would be so Can you sad. imagine? Oh, please like, tell me this is not the future, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, where's my professional development? Where's my growth? How do I know it is going to change from what we're currently doing? Yeah. So yeah. Cherry, what are they? It's a, it's a vision for your future. Mm-hmm. It is. And, and it's, it's feeling the seen and heard, right? And okay. it is having a job that is now one of the things I think that's interesting too about these concepts is you do have to individualize them. So some people are going to want a job that's super creative. Some people are going to want a job that's super meaningful. Some people are going to want a job like, so there's some individualization to each of these things. The way I'm seen and heard is probably different than you. The future things I want are probably different than you. Yeah. So you can't do these, I don't know, one size fits all, like, we're just going to create a, like the one, and we have it. And so I shouldn't make fun of it, but <laughs> the Wednesday afternoon, no meetings, that's going to solve all our problems. <laughs> It'll help. Yeah. But. So, so it is both, we do have to create space. We do have to say we're doing too many things. Right. But that in and of itself does not solve the problem of, is this meaningful work? Do I see a future? Am I learning things? Am I being challenged? Um, And so it's funny because it's like you want these really specific things, which are good things to do, but they have to be tied to a purpose. They can't just be in isolation. People being like, okay, now we've solved everything. What was I just had an article the other day, which was like higher education is headed for burnout and a T-shirt isn't going to solve it. Right. Because this is sometimes what we do, like just Give them pizza and a t-shirt. No, that's not going to workshop on burnout. Everybody can (laughs) learn about it and spend three hours doing that. No. (laughs) So um, that piece of, I just love that for our students, those things are true as well. They want to have a vision. They want to be challenged. They want to love what they're doing. They want to be seen and heard. And we can apply those things to how we can assess where we are and just make it a good place for us to be, as opposed to focusing only on all of the little things that we have to do and, and being crazy brained in that. Right. Um, okay. I do have some 
action items, but I want to say one of the things that I love about higher education is that we do not have to search too hard for meaningful work. And most of us got into higher education because we love our students. We see this as a time when they are doing these final pieces before they launch student development, um, growing as young adults, right there. It's just this place where they're still malleable and we can still have influence and we can have mentorship and we can teach them. And also we really believe in the power of higher education to change people's lives. And so I, I'm thankful to be in this business where we don't have to make up some reason why it's meaningful. It actually is very, very meaningful. I think our problem is that we are so committed to good work that we forget to be kind and careful of ourselves. And that's really where we make um, a difference. So I just, my um, inspiration for everybody is to be careful with yourself and to care for you. I don't know if I've said this to you before, Sherry, but I was reading a book one time and it said, would you ever, um, talk to somebody else or expect of somebody else, what you expect and what you say to yourself. And I, and it was in a time when I was in higher education and I was like not eating lunch because I was having to meet with these students. So I was like, not, you know, I just wasn't taking good care of myself. And I was like, I can't imagine for one of my employees being like, you need to skip lunch because these students need you. I would never treat another person like that. And so I think that's a that's one of the ways that we can correct for ourselves to say, would you ever tell your student worker, you need to work at the pace I'm working. You need to, you know, carry everything that we would never do that. We don't have expectations. Other people would do that. We're only unkind to ourselves in that way. So I think we have to be very careful. Okay, I have some action items for us. So I did a lot of research. I'm in a lot of listservs and I'm in a lot of Facebook groups around higher education and the pandemic. And um, so much of the conversation is about demonstrating gratitude through honesty, time, and money. No, those are not the most important things, but they are valuable things. And they are a way that we can say in a very tangible way, you're really important and I see you and I love what you're doing. And so there was lots of conversation about, it's really funny, um, giving somebody a meal. So it's $10. If you handed them $10, they would be insulted. But if you buy them lunch, they feel cared for. You are taking care of them in a way that they maybe are not taking care of themselves. So talking about so honesty is about how we talk about how are you doing? What do you need? Okay, we need to have a minute where you need to go and take care of yourself. And so I want to create space where if somebody's struggling with that, they can tell me and they know it's important to me and I'm going to address it for them and I'm going to create space for them to be healthy, right? Um, somebody was talking about birthday time, which is at their institution, they get four hours in the month of their birthday and they can just go do whatever they want with it. And so they were saying, if, as you talk about like a culture of care, everyone would ask like, Hey, what are you going to do with your birthday time this month? Oh, I'm going to, you know, whatever. So it's a small thing, but as you talk about being seen and heard, those are ways that we can very concretely display to others. You're important. And I want to care for you. We do want to decrease our meetings and our emails, right? Because we, we need to so many things. We need to like get back to reasonable, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, think about how you're filling people's schedules with those things and make sure. And, you know, I've, I've been saying for almost the entire time, we just have to get more efficient. We just, because we are having to do more with less time. I don't have time for any crazy business. We've got to get more efficient and I've got to be able to get in, do what I need to do that's important and then move on to the next thing. So I think that's really important. Um, small steps to build a culture of belonging. So I, um, one of the things I appreciate about this is the idea that I was just talking to uh, somebody the other day, I think he was a VP for student success. And he was saying, I've said to all of my people, I want you to make a list of everything you're doing. And then you and I are going to go through and we're going to cross things off. 
And so he was showing me like, here's a, here's a three page list of everything this person is responsible for. We're going to say that can wait, that can wait. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Forget about that. It's not, we're not seeing a return on it. I think part of that culture of belonging is creating space for people whose schedules you have responsibility for to say, I want to protect you. And I want to make sure that you're focusing on the most important things. And if you're having a hard time not working 80 hours a week, I want to go through that list with you and say, these 50 things that you feel responsible for, yes, they're good things, but they are not the priority right now. Right. Um, So helping with those small steps of building a culture of belonging and making it a priority. Um, So many of these articles talk about uh, it being one of the measure of success that in your small teams, you have created a sense of belonging, that you are doing a great job for your people. And that's how we're going to measure you as a great manager or a great employee or a great colleague. Right. That you've done a, a good job on that. And then the last one, I love this one. Uh, in one of the articles, they were saying that they just ask all their employees, what is the minimum requirement for you to thrive? Which I like because it takes us away from how can you manage <laughs> this craziness to what do you need to feel like you are valued and have a happy, balanced sense of life? What are those things? Well, I need an afternoon off. Okay, great. Then that's what we need to do for you because I want for you to understand you are more important than the work you do. And I want to make sure that you're being protected and that you're thriving in your 10,000 hours of, is it 10,000 hours or 10,000 weeks? I can't remember. I should pull it up. Surely it's weeks. Let's go with weeks. I hope, right? (laughs) Surely it's weeks. Let's go with that one. Um, But I really love that. And I think as we're saying, you need to be talking about burnout. You need to be honest about it and transparent about it. I think it's a great question to just ask our colleagues, hey, what do you need? What is the bare minimum for you to feel like you're really thriving? Um, Because it at least will help them identify the things that are stealing from them. Right. So action items. Sherry. I'm so glad to spend time with you. We should maybe, maybe in our every other week meetings, we should just record it and then people can join us and (laughs) enjoy our conversations. Mostly we're talking about how do we empower and um, affirm and encourage those of you who are on the front line with students uh, in this crazy time. And so it's really nice to be able to break that down into burnout and thinking about Maslow and how you can create a culture that people want to be part of because it's it's really fundamental to the work that we're doing. Yeah. Um, thank you, ma'am. Always good to thank see you. you. Uh, don't forget everyone to subscribe so that you can get all of our future conversations. Next week, I am doing an interview with our anchor um, athlete. Uh, It's our very first um, sponsorship. Jessica Angelo is a volleyball player. And so we are going to um, do an interview with her about her experience. And then the week after that, I'm talking about career readiness and how to help students as they're choosing their major. And so that is a topic near and dear to my heart. So that will be a really good one too. So thanks for joining me, friends. 